Um, in fact, uh, the fluids, because I'll be talking about a class of fluids uh, that this talk is concerned with are biological fluids that uh, appear in uh, human joints. So if you think about your wrist uh, in, in uh, uh, the wrist um, and in other joints, there is a fluid, a synovial fluid, which is a chemical reacting fluid. It is a fluid which uh, behaves completely differently than water. Water is a Newtonian fluid, and I'll explain what the Newtonian fluid is in a moment. This fluid, this uh, synovial fluid that is in human joints is a non-Newtonian fluid. And to describe the behavior of this uh, non-Newtonian fluid, the synovial fluid, one has to look at fairly complicated nonlinear partial differential equations, which I will show you. So my own interests are in the construction of numerical methods for the approximate solution of these nonlinear partial differential equations. And what this uh, talk is about is uh, constructing numerical methods for which you can prove convergence of the sequence of numerical approximations to a solution of this partial differential equation. So one of the technical uh, problems that we encountered when we were looking at this class of partial differential equations is, uh, was the following. We were using finite element methods. And in order to prove convergence of finite element methods, you need to develop certain bounds on the sequence of approximate solutions in order to be able to deduce convergence of the sequence of approximations. You will all be familiar with uh, the bolzano weierstrass theorem from basic analysis. So if you have a bounded sequence, you know that you can extract a convergent subsequence. The corresponding result here is that you have a sequence of finite element approximations. But the problem is that unlike this bolzano weierstrass theorem, which is stated um, uh, on the real line, it concerns a sequence of real numbers. Here, we are dealing with a function, sequence of functions, the sequence of finite element approximations, which live in an infinite dimensional space. And then the question arises, if you have some bound on the sequence of approximations that you have generated in this in infinite dimensional space, how can you deduce anything about a convergence of perhaps a sub subsequence of these approximations? One peculiarity of uh, uh, the problem that I'm going to talk about is the fact that for, for reasons that we can't control, one needs uh, what is called a Hölder norm bound on the sequence of numerical approximations. And the question was here, how to come up with a bound on the sequence of finite element approximations in this Hölder norm? It turns out, and I'm trying to explain the title here, it turns out that in the theory of partial differential equations, there is such theory. So if you have the solutions to elliptic or parabolic partial differential equations, uh, one of the big results in this field is this one by De Georgi, Nash, and Moser, which guarantees Hölder norm bounds on uh, solutions to partial differential equations. So the question that we ask ourselves, is it possible for finite element approximations to construct similar bounds in Hölder norms on the sequence of finite element approximations. And I will explain why we needed this. So this is the explanation of the title, discrete the Georgi nash moser theory, which concerns these finite element approximations applied to these synovial fluids that arise in a mathematical biology. Incidentally, please feel free to interrupt me. I understand that most of you are muted, but maybe Professor Turk, <laughs> if he sees the question, then please, uh, and, uh, please uh, feel uh, free to interrupt me. Yes, sure, thank you. So uh, let, me, let me say a few words about the partial differential equation. So um, you, may be a uh, um, you may be familiar with the Navier-Stokes equations. The Navier-Stokes equations involve two quantities, the velocity u and the pressure p of the fluid. If the fluid is incompressible, then the divergence of the velocity field is equal to zero in a domain omega in which you are considering your fluid. So this is incompressibility of the fluid. The second line here, and I'm considering the case when the problem is independent of time, otherwise there is a time derivative also present in the equation, let's just ignore this. So the second equation comes from a physical law uh, called conservation of, of linear momentum or balance of linear 
linear momentum. So you have the divergence of U tensor U. So just to explain this, so U is a vector, it's the velocity vector. U tensor U is a matrix, it's a dyadic matrix whose entries are U, R, U sub I times U sub J. So that is the IJ entry of this matrix. You take this divergence of that matrix, you get a vector. On the right-hand side, B is a force vector source term. P is the pressure scalar quantity gradient of the pressure is a vector. So this is a vector equation. So what describes a Newtonian fluid is a particular relationship that sits in the middle here, the divergence of the stress tensor. This S is the stress tensor and the stress tensor depends on D of U and D of U by definition is the symmetric gradient of the velocity. U is the velocity, grad U is the gradient of the velocity. That's a matrix. You transpose that matrix, you have a symmetric matrix. So that is D of U. For Newtonian fluids such as water, I have a glass of uh, water here in front of me. If I move it around, these would be the equations that would describe the motion of this fluid. In the case of water, there is a linear, I emphasize the word linear, relationship between S, the stress tensor, the Cauchy stress tensor, or shear stress, and D of U, this uh, symmetric velocity gradient. The proportionality factor in this linear relationship is the viscosity. Mu here is the viscosity coefficient. So this is uh, what is called a constitutive relationship. This is what describes the nature of the fluid that you are talking about. In the case of water, this is a linear constitutive relationship between the deviatoric stress tensor S and the symmetric velocity uh, gradient D of U involving the viscosity coefficient of the fluid. So in the case of these fluids that I'm interested in, uh, this relationship will be much more complicated than I will show you on the next slide. Here is a, a joint and you can think about your wrist or your knees. There is um, a region here inside uh, the wrist or your knee, which is called the synovium. This synovium is filled with the synovial fluid. And if you look at this other picture, you will see from the picture uh, that uh, this fluid flows in a different way than how water would flow. So clearly this simple relationship that we have for water is not the one that you would want to use to describe the motion of this complicated fluid. So then the question is, what exactly should this relationship be? So here is what is uh, coming out from various uh, laboratory experiments based on data fitting, how uh, the shear stress S relates to uh, the symmetric a velocity gradient. So in the case of uh, water, all this crazy stuff that you see here in this prefactor is absent. So if you look at the exponent here, say so R, if R of C, and I tell you what this R of C is, if R of C is two, two minus two is zero. So you raise this guy to power zero, that's one. You are back to uh, the Navier-Stokes equations, but here, this is a much more complicated relationship. Uh, K1 and K2 are just two parameters. And this R of C is a function. So it's not a constant, it's a function. And this function R depends on another function, the concentration. And this concentration is the concentration of a chemical called hyaluronin, which is contained in the synovial fluid. And so what happens is that I can't tell you in advance what this R of C is because R of C depends on C and C is a solution of another partial differential equation. And this equation here, which governs uh, the behavior of C, C is the concentration. And you see that this other partial differential equation involves uh, the velocity field from the, uh, from the fluid equation. So there is a coupling between the partial differential equation the concentration C enters into R of C, R of C enters into the exponent, then this exponent enters in this constitutive relationship, which enters into the fluid equation, and then the velocity from the fluid equation U enters into the concentration equation. So these partial differential equations are unfortunately completely coupled. So this is, I mean, you look at these equations, you say, this is absolutely terrible. This is, this is not nice. Uh, so if you were lucky, which is not the case here, if you were lucky and this concentration would be identically zero, which it isn't, 
uh, if R, C would be identically zero, E to the power zero is one, for example, one minus one is zero, then R of C is identically two. If R of C is identically two, then you are back to a Newtonian fluid. So the fact that uh, for us, uh, C will not be identically zero is a reflection of the fact that we are not modeling a Newtonian fluid. This is a completely different fluid that we are dealing with. So, uh, and then I don't know whether that, uh, any questions at this point, is everything okay? Is it possible to follow what I'm talking about? It, it seems uh, uh, all right. I may ask one thing uh, since you, you asked uh, this. Uh, so you have two expressions for RC. These are, um, maybe it is relevant to this study, but these are experimental results or? Uh, correct, or... correct, correct. So, so these, uh, these two expressions are two examples based on data fitting. Um, but uh, professor, one one more thing. Uh, what about the they are the steady state in in they are in a steady state uh, uh, phase, so they they don't change with respect to time. Or yes, so th this is an assumption. Uh, we made this assumption because we do not know at the moment how to analyze the time dependent case. Ah, okay. okay. So one can complicate this by adding the time derivative, but I, I have no idea. If anybody can help me with the analysis of the time-dependent problem, I shall be very happy. Okay. Yes, uh, so perhaps uh, since you asked me about R of C, one thing uh, that is interesting about both of these examples of R of C, you can see that what is in this bracket is always less than or equal than zero because C is non-negative. So what is in the bracket is less than or equal than zero. So in these applications of relevance, R of C is always less than two. I can't tell you what R of C is because it depends on C, but R of C is between uh, one and two. And over here also, so what's in the bracket is again, uh, negative, well, non-positive, less than or equal than zero. So again, this other R of C is another example R of C is again between one and two, but I can't tell you what it is because it de depends on C and C depends on U and U on C. So it's all coupled. So it, when you start to look into the mathematics of these equations, and if you are familiar with putting equations into weak form, and if you have thought about function spaces in which solutions uh, should occur, one standard function space for which you would be looking uh, at solution for solutions of the Navier-Stokes equations would be the so-called Sobolev space W12, or sometimes denoted by H1. So for those of you who, uh, who are not familiar with uh, Sobolev spaces, uh, this is a set of functions whose square is integrable and which have first derivatives, hence the one here. So the first derivative is also square integrable. So think about square integrable functions whose first derivatives are square integrable. So this would be the space in which you would be looking for solutions if you would be looking at the Navier-Stokes equations. Now, clearly this is not the situation we're in. This is a completely different, completely crazy equation. This is not uh, going to be the correct solution space. It turns out, and uh, this may seem completely weird to you if you haven't seen this stuff before, is that instead of uh, the square integrability, which corresponds to this R being a two over here in this model for Navier-Stokes, we end up in some weird function spaces where instead of this exponent two square integrability, we have some kind of integrability, this R of C, which is not two identically, but it varies from point to point in the domain. So that the power of integrability is not two, but varying between one and two. And I can't tell you what this power of integrability is because it depends on the solution of this partial differential equation. So it just so happens that because this is the model, I can't change the model. I have no control over what the model is. These are the spaces in which I have to work with. And then when you start to think about these spaces, and there are books uh, on my bookshelf about these uh, variable integrability function spaces, when you look at these books, the books will tell you that this function here can't be just any old crazy function. It has to have some kind of minimum smoothness property, this R of C. And this minimum smoothness property that this function, which is not constant, has to have 
uh, is what is called log continuity. I will tell you later on what this log continuity means. It's slightly stronger than continuity and slightly weaker than Hölder continuity. A sufficient condition for this log continuity to be satisfied is that the function C is Hölder continuous because the function R, as you can see above, is always a smooth function. If C is Hölder continuous, then R of C will also be Hölder continuous and that would be fine. So to guarantee log continuity of this function, it would be sufficient to guarantee Hölder continuity of C, and that will automatically imply Hölder continuity of R of C of X, and thereby this log continuity property. But I'll be more precise about this later. So the question that arises here is how do you ensure that this function C is log continuous, or if you want a sufficient condition, how do you guarantee that this function C is Hölder? continuous. Now, if you think about where this C is coming from, it's coming from a solution of this partial differential equation. And if you assume for a moment that somebody has given you this function u, then you would be looking at an elliptic partial differential equation whose solution is this function C. There is one problem though, that uh, this function u is a solution of another equation and this d of u contains the derivative of that function. So this coefficient a that you have in this elliptic equation, in this diffusion coefficient in this equation is not a very smooth function. Typically this function a is only a bounded function, point by point. So uh, the technical term would be it's a function in L infinity. It's an essentially bounded function, but not much smoother. So the mathematical question that arises here, how do you guarantee hold that continuity of the solution of this equation here when you don't have a very smooth uh, diffusion coefficient here, maybe just a, a bounded function and nothing more. So this uh, now links to what I'm going to talk about next. So this is exactly what relates uh, what we are discussing here to Hilbert's 19th uh, problem, which he announced at the International Congress of Mathematicians in 1900 in Paris. The question that he asked, and I'll explain what the connection is, uh, was the following. So if you have a an, an, uh, problem from the calculus of variations, a minimization problem, everything is assumed to be, all functions are assumed to be smooth in the problem that you have posed. The question that Hilbert asks, is the solution of that minimization uh, problem also a smooth function? So more precisely, let me just consider a simple case. Suppose you have a minimization problem such as this one, f is a given function. I'm going to assume that f is an analytic function in x and y and u, u is the unknown function, p is an abbreviation for the partial of u with respect to x, and q is an abbreviation for partial u with respect to y. And I'm assuming that uh, f satisfies this condition here, which, can, uh, which is basically ellipticity of the associated Euler-Lagrange equation, the stationarity condition for this minimization problem. So basically what Hilbert is asking is if f is a smooth function, an analytic function of all of its uh, variables, is it true that the solution u of this minimization problem is an analytic function of x and y? So this is Hilbert's 19th problem. So this problem was open for a very, very long time. In the beginning of the century, there were various attempts to address uh, this question. So what, uh, this is the first attempt by Bernstein in 1904. What he managed to show is that if somehow you manage to show that this minimization problem has a three times continuously differentiable solution, then such a solution must automatically be an analytic function. The problem was that nobody could show at the time that there is a three times continuously differentiable solution to this problem. So there was a gap uh, between uh, the existence theory and what can be guaranteed as a solution, the regularity theory. Then uh, Hopf in 1932 managed to show that if the second derivatives uh, of this problem have held their continuity with exponent alpha, then such a solution must automatically be, be guaranteed uh, to be analytic. But then the same issue arises, how do you guarantee the existence of such solutions whose second derivatives are held there continuous? Stampakia in 1952 managed to reduce the regularity requirement further. So what he managed to prove is that if somehow somebody has given you 
uh, a solution to this minimization problem whose first derivatives are held up continuous with exponent alpha, then these solutions must be analytic functions. And Moray had a similar result in 1952. But the problem was, as I was mentioning, is that uh, the direct method of the calculus of variations, which guarantees the existence of solutions, only guarantees the existence of solutions, weak solutions, in Sobolev spaces, not in these spaces of full depth continuous functions. So you can prove the existence of solutions, but these are weak solutions. And it's not clear whether these weak solutions have uh, the appropriate regularity for you to be able to answer Hilbert's question. The big breakthrough was uh, the result of uh, De Georgi, Nash, and Moser in the mid 1950s. M Moser was a little later in the 60s, who managed to fill this gap. What they managed to show is that these weak solutions to this minimization problem do, in fact, possess the required uh, hold irregularity so that you can answer with the answer being yes, uh, Hilbert's 19th pro problem. So the answer is positive but a big gap had to be filled in. So let me show you what uh, is at the heart of this De Georgi nash uh, result. It uh, concerns the following equation. So here is um, an elliptic partial differential equation with a coefficient a, which is only a bounded function. You may have some source terms, which can be very bad. You can maybe have divergence of just the square integrable functions. So these can be uh, functions uh, that are not even functions, they are in the space of distributions. And what you are asking is, is this function C, whose existence you can guarantee as a weak solution, does this function C have hold their regularity? So here is this uh, De Georgi nash theorem uh, quoted from Ben Susan and Fraser's book. What they say is on the certain technical assumptions, which we don't have to read, uh, the weak solution, and the definition of weak solution is what is written here, this weak solution is not just a weak solution, it doesn't just lie in this Sobolev space W12 of square integrable functions with first in, uh, derivatives that are square integrable, but it also has hold irregularity. It's a continuous function, and this continuous function has hold irregularity with uh, exponent alpha. So this is this De Georgi nash moser theorem. So the question, that uh, we need to address if we are interested in finite element approximations of this partial differential equation is, can one prove some kind of discrete counterpart of this De Georgi nash moser theorem that I've stated here, by which I mean the following. Suppose you have carried out a numerical approximation of this complicated problem that I described to you, and you are looking at numerical approximations of this function C in particular, for the exact solution C, you have such a bound. This we know because it's a theorem. The question is, can you prove such a bound for the sequence of numerical approximations to the function C? So if I construct some kind of piecewise polynomial approximation to, to this function C, is it possible for these piecewise polynomial approximations to prove a similar kind of bound? This is the question. So, you could ask, well, <laughs> why, why do you care? Why, why is this important to you? The reason why this is important for me is because it turns out that in order to prove that my sequence of numerical approximations converges to the exact solution, I need such a bound. Without such a bound, I cannot prove convergence of my numerical approximations to the exact solution. So this is why I need such a bound for my numerical approximations. So the question is, the research question is, does this result have a discrete counterpart in the case of piecewise linear finite element approximations of the problem? And there, let me stop for a moment. Uh, are there any questions? Is this okay so far? Yes, uh, Professor, I don't see any questions in the okay. chat. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll carry on. So we did manage to prove such a result, and this was published in the IMA Journal of Numerical Analysis uh, uh, in the middle of last year, 2021. It's also posted on archive. If you can't access the IMA Journal of Numerical Analysis, you will find a paper on archive with uh, Lars Deening and uh, Tony Sharvey. So in terms of previous work on problems of this type, there was just one publication that we could find, and that was way back in 1986 by 
Nestor Aguilera and Luis Caffarelli, who were looking at much simpler equations. So instead of looking at uh, this complicated elliptic partial differential equation that we are concerned with, they were looking at just Laplace C equal to zero. And what they were interested in is finite element approximations of this problem. Is it possible to prove Hölder norm bounds uniformly in the step size, the grid size H in this Hölder space C alpha on omega for these uh, piecewise linear approximations. So they managed to prove such a result for this uh, much simpler problem on the certain restrictions on the mesh. Uh, so our own contribution here was that we managed to broaden much, much the class of equations. So instead of Laplace C equal to U, we managed to prove such a result for this kind of equation. And this is important for us because this is the kind of equation that we need to deal with for the synovial fluid for the concentration. Uh, we also managed to uh, uh, relax many of the various conditions that uh, uh, Aguilera and Caffarelli need, uh, needed to assume for their computational mesh. So I don't need to get into the technical details. So this is what is under the uh, second bullet point here. So we relaxed many of the assumptions in that paper. Uh, we did need a technical condition and I don't honestly understand I don't have any insight into this uh, condition. It's just a technical condition that we need on this function f that appears in the partial differential equation here on the right-hand side. What we have to assume in order to be able to prove this result is that uh, there is what we call the dominating function g for this function f that sits on the right-hand side of the equation in the sense that the divergence of g plus or minus f is less or equal than zero in some kind of negative Sokolov space. So it's sort of a technical assumption that we need it. Uh, in the special case, when f is zero, this condition is trivially satisfied by, I don't know, you could take g to be zero in that case. So what you see on this slide is the discrete counterpart of this oh, Schmoser theorem that was stated on the previous slide. Again, there are some technical assumptions that we don't need to go through. The statement is that when you look at the piecewise linear approximation of the solution of this concentration equation, what we can show is that uh, these uh, uh, piecewise linear approximations in this Hölder norm, C alpha and omega bar are bounded uniformly independent of the mesh size. And this is re really the result that we need later on in order to prove convergence of solutions to the exact solution of the partial differential equation that we are looking at. And you will find this result stated in, in the paper. Uh, with uh, Lars Deening and Tony Scharner. So now that we have our technical tools, this is our toolkit basically, uh, in order to tackle uh, the real problem and the real problem that we are interested in is, is this uh, set of partial differential equation um, uh, describing the synovial fluid that I mentioned. We have an incompressible fluid. This is uh, the balance of linear momentum equation. This is the concentration equation. You can see that these equations are coupled. Once again, U is the velocity, C is the concentration, P is the pressure, B is a given function, external force. We are looking for the velocity. We are looking for the pressure and we are looking for the concentration, which is non-negative and supposed to satisfy these equations. D of U is the same as before same notation, but this S function will be this complicated expression that I showed you earlier um, for, for the synovial fluid. Uh, we assume some very simple boundary conditions because the problem was already quite complicated as it was. So what we are assuming is that the fluid is in a closed container. U is uh, the velocity zero on the boundary. We assume that the concentration is prescribed on the boundary of the fluid domain, there is some assumption on how smooth this boundary function has to be and so forth. There are various assumptions on these nonlinear expressions that appear in the equation. So S is this um, uh, expression uh, appearing in this constitutive law. And I showed you two examples. You remember when Professor Turk asked me about these functions uh, in the beginning of the talk, I showed you examples of S. So uh, these functions of interest that appear in this model do satisfy these structural assumptions that we assume here there's some kind of boundedness assumption which is satisfied. There's a monotonicity assumption that is satisfied. There's a certain 
condition on the growth rate that is assumed in this general um, theorem that is satisfied uh, for these models. And this exponent r that appears here, which would be two in the case of the Navier-Stokes equations, and therefore r prime, which is defined as what is called the Holder conjugate of r. So if r is identically to r prime is identically to. So for the Navier-Stokes equation, this would be two and this would be two. For this model, this uh, r function will depend on the concentration and the concentration will be a solution of the concentration equation. So there are assumptions on this um, uh, S function, and there are similar assumptions on this Q function, which we need for the theory. So they are stated here. We don't have to spend time on this. These are just sort of technical assumptions. And once again, uh, going back to my examples, so um, in our case, S looks like this. So it's not constant times D of U, it's some complicated function times D of U. And this complicated function looks like this. And I showed you examples of this R of C. R of C could be this function or it could be this function. So these, these, this is the situation that we are in. So now I, I'm not going to go into uh, what's going to come uh, next. This, this is a complete technical nightmare. So I'm not sure whether you have already had lunch. This is not what you want to see before lunch, not even before dinner. <laughs> uh, the reason I'm showing you this, uh, this weird stuff is it, just to, uh, so that you appreciate the importance of this Holder norm requirement that I need for the concentration. I mentioned to you that for the Navier-Stokes equations, we work in standard function spaces. Because of this vari variable integrability, instead of R of X, this uh, exponent in the function space being two, so we are not dealing with square integrable functions, we are dealing with uh, functions whose integrability here varies from point to point in the domain. So these are called these variable integrability uh, Lebesgue spaces. And this is the norm, how it is defined in this space. And there are counterparts of Sobolev spaces where you have variable integrability from point to point of the function and the gradient of the function is not square integrable, but uh, the exponent of integrability also varies from point to point. And these norms that you see here, which look very strange, are called Luxembourg norms. They collapse to the usual Lebesgue norms when the integrability is a constant. So these are the spaces we are forced to work in. Now, it turns out that for, for these spaces to be meaningful, you need some, some sort of assumption on this R of X, the exponent. You can't just work with any old crazy function R of X because these spaces will not be, for example, Banach spaces you need some minimal regularity of this function R of X. So let me go back to this assumption that is labeled two star here. This is on the previous uh, uh, slide here. Uh, so two star is the assumption that this exponent that appears uh, in this Lebesgue space is strictly bounded away from one and strictly bounded away from infinity. If this is the case, then these weird looking spaces are in fact Banach spaces. That's good news. So that's one uh, uh, ingredient. So then using uh, these weird spaces, you can write down the solution spaces for these uh, strange partial differential equations. You have these variable integrability, Sobolev space with zero boundary condition. Uh, you need, uh, because you are working with incompressible fluids, you need to incorporate uh, that uh, divergence of the velocity is equal to zero. And this is the space, this third line here is the space for the pressure. Now, I'm coming finally to the point. I mentioned these various conditions that have to be satisfied by this uh, integrability exponent. The crucial one is this assumption down here, and this is this log holder continuity of this exponent R of X that appears in all of these exponents here. And this weird looking condition is needed. This is sort of a minimal condition that is required on the function R of X so that you have proper spaces. Without this condition, these spaces are terrible. So this is basically the minimum assumption that you can work with. Uh, and this is this Holder or log, log continuity property. A sufficient condition for this to be satisfied is that R of X is in fact Holder continuous. 
If R of X is whole, there continues that automatically implies that this log continuity property is satisfied. And then you are happy because then you are working with nice spaces. So this really was the motivation why I was interested in well, that continuity of the concentration because the concentration enters into R. And if the concentration is held there, then R of the concentration will be a held there continuous function, and I'm happy. I satisfy this assumption. And we need a similar kind of thing for the finite element approximation. So I, I hope that this is roughly clear what I'm, what I'm on about. So what you see here on this slide is the weak formulation. So this is what is meant by a solution to this problem for the velocity for the pressure and the concentration. These are the equalities that have to be satisfied for you to have a meaningful notion of solution. And this slide that you see in front of you is the one that you need to use to construct finite element approximations of these equations. The construction of finite element approximations is typically quite simple. In, instead of working with infinite dimensional spaces, you work with finite dimensional subspaces of these infinite dimensional spaces. And these finite dimensional subspaces you choose to consist of piecewise polynomial functions on some triangulation of your computational grid. So to construct a finite element approximation, you simply replace these infinite dimensional spaces with finite dimensional subspaces. And this leads you to this expression here. So this is the numerical method that we are using, simply replacing infinite dimensional spaces with finite dimensional subspaces. So U sub H on some computational grid of size H is the approximation of the velocity. P sub H is the approximation of the pressure. C sub H, on this computational grid of finest H is the approximation of the concentration. And they come respectively from various finite dimensional subspaces of these infinite dimensional spaces. So this is the definition of the numerical approximation. We can show that uh, the numerical approximation exists, that's fine. But then the theoretical question that is of interest to me at least is what happens as you send the grid size H to zero? Is it true that the, compu the computed solutions that you have found on your computer will converge to the exact solution of this partial differential equation? So this is the mathematical question that I'm interested in. I'm going to say a few words about this mathematical question, but just uh, to relax a little bit the theory, let me show you some numerical simulations just as a little uh, sort of intellectual break. So these are numerical simulations that we have uh, computed using this numerical method that I showed you. S, you see, is this complicated function that we are using. This n of c exponent is this function here, one of these examples that I showed you. This is a long, thin channel. We had to use various numerical techniques, which I don't need to get into here, to construct the finite element approximation. And the color coding uh, corresponds to various uh, sizes of the concentration. So the only thing I'm plotting here is the solution of the concentration equation. I'm not showing you the velocity. What I'm going to show you on the slide is just how big the difference is if you change this nonlinearity here to something simpler. So if instead of this uh, more complicated nonlinearity that we have to work with, you replace this with what is called the power law model, which is a much simpler nonlinearity, you see that uh, I mean, even visually, there is a big difference in, 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 the, in the solution. So if I were to show you the solution of the Navier-Stokes equation, which would be even more simpler if I just took R to be two, you wouldn't see much color in this picture. It would be really a very boring picture indeed. So now let me, uh, you, you can see if you can see the numbers at the bottom of the slides, I'm coming to the end of the talk, just a few more slides to go. Uh, what I wanted to finish with is just to show you some glimpse without going into technical details of how this convergence proof works. So what you again uh, have to have in mind is what I mentioned in the beginning, think about the bolzano weierstrass theorem. And once again, the bolzano weierstrass theorem for a sequence of real numbers is simply that if you have a bounded sequence of real numbers, you can extract a convergent subsequence. Here, the situation is uh, more complicated because we have a sequence of functions and these sequence of functions as h tends to zero lives in an infinite dimensional space. One of these weird spaces that you saw with various 
uh, variable integrability orders. And the question is, what exactly is the counterpart of bolzano weierstrass in these spaces? So what we are after is just as in bolzano weierstrass you want to talk about bounded sequences, what we are after here is bounds on the sequence of approximate solutions. What sort of bounds can you show as age, the mesh size tends to zero on your sequence of approximations? So what we can prove are various inequalities. This is a bound on the gradient of the velocity. Uh, H is the mesh size. You see this uh, weird exponent here, which is not a constant. It depends on C sub H, the solution, numerical solution of the concentration. And I need to have some information about C of H in order to be able to say that, like in bolzano weierstrass I can extract a convergent subsequence. So this is exactly the place where I need this information that the Hölder norm of the numerical approximation to the concentration is bounded independent of the mesh size. Because if I can say such a thing, then I can also say something about how these UHs converge. So we have these various inequalities. I once again emphasize this result here, which comes from this discrete De Georgi nash moser theorem that we managed to prove. So once you have these bounds, then you have to do some hard analysis. And this hard analysis is basically the counterpart of bolzano weierstrass in infinite dimensional spaces. So what you can extract from these boundedness properties is that you have a weakly convergent sequence, whatever weak convergence means. If you're not familiar with weak convergence, just think about convergence, roughly speaking, uh, of a sequence of functions to uh, a function u in some function space, the Sobolev space. Uh, you have also strong convergence, which comes from compact embedding of the Sobolev space into Lebesgue space. You have weak convergence of these constitutive relations to an object, and you do not know at this stage what this object is. So the hardest part in this proof is to figure out what exactly this, these guys have converged to. The reason why this is important is you want to pass to the limit in your numerical method. So when you look at your numerical approximation, you want to send h to zero in the numerical approximations. And in the numerical approximations, you have these expressions. So you need to know what exactly these objects have converged to. At this point in the argument, all you can say is that you have converged to something, but you, you do not know what this something is. What you would like to say is that something that you have converged to is in fact. So what you would like to say is that s tilde is precisely s of C and DU. This is what you would like to say. But at this point in the argument, the, you do not know this. This has to be proved. Similarly, you have some kind of weak convergence of the pressure. You also have weak convergence of the concentrations. This nonlinear expression that appears in the concentration equation also converges weakly to something. But again, similarly as above, you have converged to an object and you do not know what this object is. You would like to say, you would like to say, but you can't at this moment, you would like to say that Q tilde is Q sub C of C, grad C and D of U, but this is not clear. This has to be proved. So then the important ingredient in order to finish this proof is precisely what we managed to prove this uh, Hölder continued uniform Hölder bound of these concentrations concentration approximations, which allows you to uh, show convergence of the sequence of approximate concentrations to uh, C, a function in this Hölder space. Using this result, we can trace back these various arguments and show that this S tilde function, which we have converged to, is exactly what you would have liked to converge to, S of C and DU. And we can also show you using precisely this result that this object uh, that you have converged to here is precisely Q of C, grad C, and DU. So this is sort of the hard step in um, the analysis. And in order to do this, we do need uh, these uh, uh, uniform Hölder bounds that we uh, managed to prove. So coming to my last slide, that lots of uh, technical tools that were involved. So basically everything is thrown in, including the kitchen sink, uh, everything that you can think of. We needed, uh, I didn't go into the details, we needed something called Minty's method from the theory of monotone operators. 
we needed one additional technical tool, which is something called the discrete counterpart of Bogovsky's operator. So this Bogovsky operator is an inverse of the divergence operator. We also need something called um, a finite element counterpart of uh, Lipschitz truncation method uh, due to Acerbi and Fusco, which uh, we managed to develop in an earlier paper uh, with uh, Lars Dinning and Christian Kreutz. And all of this is needed in these crazy variable order Sobolev spaces. Um, much of the stuff that I talked to you about today is in the PhD thesis of my doctoral student, Tony Charle, who successfully finished his doctorate in 2020. So with that, uh, uh, Professor Turk Teşekkür uh, ederim. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much.